It's a great um, evening tonight. We are uh, uh, here to preview our summer exhibitions and uh, the two artists who we are celebrating are June Clark and Terence Gower. They both have been here in group exhibitions in the early 1990s, so it's been a while. Uh, and now they're returning with their most extensive presentations to date, exhibitions to date, both of them. And although they're of different generations, um, there's so much, um, so much that they share. <laughs> okay, Terence says that it's almost the same. Okay, we'll, we'll take it. There was this idea that the two of them should be in conversation and share some of their experience and find those common points of reference from their both personal lives but also um, uh, their work. And uh, so this is going to be a very, as Terence said, unscripted conversation uh, where I'm going to be here just to make sure they don't get lost. One of the things that comes to mind right away in uh, uh, thinking and looking at uh, uh, June's work and uh, Terence's work is that first of all their personal, how much they've been shaped by of course personal uh, histories uh, but also history with a big H, with the capital H, and how they have followed the reverse trajectories uh, between Canada and the United States. June was born in the United States and came to Canada in 1968. Uh, June was born in Canada and Terence. No, uh, sorry, <laughs> Terence. See? I'm flattered, but <laughs> Terence was uh, born in Canada, but uh, made a journey towards the U.S. and became an American citizen. And how uh, both of them, in their work, uh, engage with that history and with that country. And I, of course, I would be remiss not to mention that. June has several presentations in Toronto at the moment and uh, the one at the Art Gallery of Ontario which just reopened again this week uh, engages very uh, kind of head-on with the United States and uh, the, the motif of the flag um, and of course another presentation as part of the uh, Toronto Triennial at uh, MOCA. So I will pass on the microphone literally to you June and uh, Terence you have your own microphone and I will let you kind of take it away and talk about um, how you see your work and your lives kind of um, reflected in and uh, you know, where you find those points of uh, um, reflection. So do you want to tell a little bit of personal history each, like about our, our, our kind of reverse migrations that we did? It's, it's interesting. Um, you first? Well, as you say, I came to Canada in 68 with the uh, MPs hot on our tail uh, because of course the Vietnam War and uh, came to <laughs> <laughs> came to uh, Toronto began uh, photographing just as a way of not having to go into therapy, having, <laughs> to, <laughs> having left so abruptly and fell in actually with a group of women, mm -hmm. women's photography cooperative we formed and uh, met Lisa and Laura. So already in the already in the late '60s or early '70s, I guess you started doing the photo work. Was it? Yeah. Well, it was late '60s, '68 mm -hmm. to be exact. Yeah. Was when we came across the border. Uh, and you're, you're describing it as a way to kind of get you your can, bearings. You know, yes, yeah. if you can believe it. At that time, given what's happening today, one could apply for landed immigrant status at the border. <laughs> as long as you ticked all of this the dots and had $500 in cash, uh, you could apply and become a landed immigrant. In front of the portrait of the queen. In exactly. front of the court, that's right. So I had, I, it's funny because I, I, I grew up in Canada but I moved to Mexico actually in 1993 um, from Vancouver. Um, and so I have a, a long over 30 year Mexican connection as well. And that was my emigration. And then after about two years, moved to, the, moved to New York uh, with my partner who had, who had a position in New York. Um, 
And so that was kind of the reverse. So then, really, that's been my base ever since, between New York and, and Mexico City, actually. That's been mm -hmm. kind of the two. Um, in a way, this project for me is it's kind of my portrait of the place that I've moved to. Um, this, you know, this huge installation, this huge exhibition. Um, it's a way of dealing with that place that I've, that I've gone. It's uh, of analyzing and thinking about it and maybe maybe finding my place there as a Canadian, but it's, uh, I don't know if I ever found that place. I think I've always considered myself as an exile, as a Canadian in that place. Of course. Even though I've got the two, two nationalities now mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You gave up your US yes. citizenship, which is yes, interesting, yes, yes. which is an incredible gesture and we, we had a lot we've had a lot of discussions about this and I think the the AGO project is super clear uh, which I just saw today for the first time mm -hmm. and we'd been, we'd been discussing it about this this sense of kind of allegiance well yeah I once you uh, again as I say when you start school at seven and from that day until you graduate grade 12 every single day you have your hand over your heart and you pledge allegiance not to the country, not to the president, you will pledge allegiance to the flag. And uh, that type of indoctrination is, Amer is American as well as amazing because you don't realize it until you become an adult and begin trying to find out who you are, and then you, under, you begin to understand how you're feeling in different situations. We're talking about the exhibition, but maybe more directly to stay with this dynamic between United States and Canada, mm -hmm. which is, you know, shows, shows up in different ways in your work. Some of the work was existing for both of you, but there's also new work that you produce for this exhibition and both those new works, so I would like to, for you to take a bit of time to talk about them, reflect actually on, on this kind of, uh, to, you know, uh, US-Canada relationship mm -hmm. at different times. You know, I'm thinking about treks. Yes. And I'm thinking about um, uh, the Ottawa case uh, study. Case study. Yeah. yeah. And then um, also this idea of how individuals could shape history, but how history shapes individuals. Mm. Because you yourself say that I'm a product of the Cold War, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yep. <laughs> you are a product of so many histories, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but then also there are those individuals that you reference sometimes in the work that have changed history, like Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. Elian mm -hmm. Gonzalez, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about those new works in, in the exhibition. If also, I think what's interesting is family as well. Yes. And I don't think it's exp explicitly mm -hmm. mentioned in my work. Much your work, of course, is, you know, so much of it is about family and about that exploring and mm -hmm. analyzing that history. Um, but this, and we've talked about a number of times, this project for me is very much mm -hmm. a product of my family formation as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but you first. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, well, the, the uh, Tubman pieces, mm -hmm. I'm, of course, one can't not be fascinated mm -hmm. by Tubman and, and what she managed to accomplish. I, I, I tend to try and do homage to all of the people I admire and I just can't imagine. I mean, there, there are two different histories, one saying that she did 19 and one 13, but one, just one uh, trip mm -hmm. back would have been amazing is, for is, her. Is, Monumentally for heroic, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, and she just kept going back yeah. and uh, trying to to uh, save as many people as possible. And for me, again, I I use the the uh, railroad ties mm -hmm. to talk about the underground railroad, but I also it's an homage to my dad, yeah. who at 11 with his seven brothers had to leave the farm on in North Carolina because there was no work in the 30s and uh, he went to just about every state in the Union on the railroad to at one point having 
to, at 11 years old, watch his brother being beaten to death by railroad cops. And what do you do when you're 11? You just have to keep going. So it's a bit of that as well as the Tubman story. So you'll see with uh, the keepers, I put a railroad tie on his, <laughs> his uh, monument. So you have the kind of privilege that you can, you can trace these histories through your family history, mm -hmm. which, is, which is incredible. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a kind of beautiful conduit. That we you are can the use. United States. Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. For me, it's, the, my, my, it's my parents' influence, really. So you, I, I would say both my mother and father are in this exhibition. So I use architecture, of course, to, mm -hmm. as a way to talk about um, geopolitical and ideological events, I guess, or, or structures or systems in the world. Um, and architecture comes from my father, who is an architect in, in, the, in the West, in British Columbia. And so that was extremely formative for me. Um, and I, when I decided to become an artist, I was, it was kind of between architecture, architecture and art. I decided I could kind of explore uh, the things I wanted to and talk about things I wanted to, using architecture as a kind of study. Mm -hmm. My mother was, an, was a commissioner on the CRTC and was very involved in, in um, Canadian content regulation in the 1970s. So we had this, this is a kind of constant theme in the family was US cultural imperialism and how are we gonna fight back against it with Canadian culture, cultural content. Mm -hmm. And so that was very present also for me all through the 70s growing up was this, um, was this kind of menace coming from the US and it was, it was a cultural menace and of course it was, it was the assured mutual destruction as well. You know, there's a sense of the, mm -hmm. the nuclear arsenal and, and, and that fear mm -hmm. um, as a kind of, Paranoid Canadian, <laughs> which I still am. Yeah. And do you want to talk about Ottawa, the Ottawa case? So the so Adeline is asking about the new the new project, which is a new commission for this show. It's called Ottawa Case Studies. So there are three there are four installations in the show. Three of them. Well, the first one that I did was about Baghdad. The second one about Havana. The third one about Saigon. As you can see, they're very kind of hot sites as far as. U.S. foreign policy and U.S. Mm. interventions around the world. And as the fourth one, I decided to work with Ottawa, so to kind of include Canada as a site of possible U.S. intervention um, and exploring all the possibilities and, and ways that the, that, the, that the U.S. has intervened in Canada, mostly culturally, as we're talking. But, but I've chosen in this particular installation to focus on the CIA, the Secret Service and with the, uh, the, the different actions, et cetera, that, they, 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 that took place in Canada, and their, especially their collaboration with Canadian Secret Service. That's kind of the theme of, the, of this new piece. And all sorts of things came out. It was interesting because, you know, we're always, we're always looking for like, oh, the bad, the bad United States and the poor Canadians that are oppressed by them. And of course, what I really found was enormous amounts of opportunism and collaboration and a lot, of, a lot of money being made by the Canadians, <laughs> thanks to our friends south of the border. Um, that, was, that was a big part of the narrative that emerged as well. Mm. So we're not all innocent up here, just, no. like, just like victims of the... <laughs> We've never been. We've never been, I think. That never it, been, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, the work is very, it's, it's, uh, it's fresh, it's different, it's very material. It's very, it, the, the choice of materials is also very interesting. There is this very strong sculptural presence. So um, could you both uh, talk about kind of the choice of materials and uh, for you, June, also this transition from, you know, making photographs or how you started with photography mm -hmm. and how it, uh, it developed it into... Evolved uh, into... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I, uh, well, I began as a photographer and then went into uh, photo etching. But I, I find that often I, 2 a.m., wake up, <laughs> think of something, and then try and figure out how to make it mm -hmm. come. So that's why so much of my material is all over the place, because I try and figure out the best way visually mm -hmm. to say what I'd like to say. And, and that happened with Harlem Quilt, going back to have the residency in Harlem and 
being traumatized <laughs> because, of course, I didn't leave Harlem until I was an adult. And then I, I went back for this residency at the Studio Museum. And it was schizophrenic for me because, in fact, I went back and so much had changed and absolutely nothing mm -hmm. had changed. And it was traumatizing for me in that way. And that's how Harlem Quilt came about because I was trying to, being a photographer, you do edit everything. So I had to figure out how, how I was going to approach this place I lived. So in the morning, I use a little Leica, and in the morning I would set it and have it at my hip and walk around and just do this, just so I could just figure out what was going on with this place that had formed me. And uh, I, I never knew what I had until I processed it. And um, that's how I came to terms with living back in, uh, in this place that, as I say, formed me. Yeah, I, th I feel like the, the material, I mean, your photo work is super material. Like mm -hmm. you see what it's, you see the emotion, you see what it's made, you see the support. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of the material in your work is, is, is really associated and derives its meaning from the objects. And the objects are very clear, very material. The railroad ties, for instance. Yes. I mean, that's a thing that's, um, it's iron, it's a, but, it, but it's, it's an artifact at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, in, you know, in, in contrast to the way I'm, so I'm often, you see some forms that I'm making that are, for instance, a form of that roof that you see. Um, translate it into other materials, so it's different. So it's like, yes. a, so I'm, I'm, I'm evoking an artifact, but often through translating it into another material. Uh, you're, there's an incredible kind of um, tactility, like the flag work is, is really, it's your hands that made, it's clearly, you were ripping this thing up, or right. um, the photo work as well. And I think um, I work with a lot of fabricators and people that make the work for me, because it's too difficult and ambitious for me to make myself. Right. And then I, I started to think that the, for me, the hand and the, the kind of tactility is there with for the viewer in a way. So I make that present and it's actually the, the viewer actually interacting and touching that thing and, and in, encountering the object with their body. Mm -hmm. For me, that's in a way where the materiality is. The flag, it was such a part of my schooling. And I remember tearing when I saw the flag or heard the national anthem and this, everything. This, like ingrained patriotism. It, ingrained yeah. and uh, Which we it don't have. was the uh, uh, moral disengagement piece where I realized one day I was in the studio and I was just pulling threads from this flag that I would bought. And I looked around and I had all these flags and I went, girl, get a grip. <laughs> <laughs> You've been hoarding them? I love it. <laughs> and, so, and I had to figure out what was going on and how I had to come to terms with that indoctrination of the flag. And because, what a way to do I it. Say, wow. It's, I, I was so, I, what a way to do it. I was so blown away by the, by that yeah. installation. In the think of protests, you know, how do you really go to the absolute limit in the U.S. in a protest, you burn the American flag. Yeah. Um, that's the absolute ultimate thing you can do. And I did a, a lot of insane. protests, you, but I but couldn't you, burn you, it. But you but did then, it in, kind of in private and kind of ritualistically the, in this exactly. way. Which is I, well, so I was trying to come to terms with this, yep. you know, I, you know how you, what, what is it you call when someone's brainwashed and then they send them someplace to unbrainwash them? That's what those... Deprogrammed. Deprogrammed. Exactly, exactly. I yeah. deprogrammed myself over a period of 20, 25 years. I want to thank you both for 
being a, a remaining Canadian, becoming Canadian. <laughs> I hope we didn't offend anyone American in the audience. <laughs> um, and for making the work you do, especially at a time like this, when art is so important in grounding us in our understanding of our uh, place in the world at this moment in time. And I think that you both engage with uh, recent and more distant histories in, in ways that are uh, opening up new perspectives and ways of understanding our place in the world at this moment. So I'm going to leave it at this unless you have a burning desire to add anything else. I have to say the people at the power plant are wonderful. Would you say that? That it's, it's, been, it's been incredible. This, experience. this, we, you, our names are up there, but a village made this show. A village of like-minded people. Thank you. It was a pleasure.